I, I do apologize. I didn't introduce myself. My name is Bart. I'm one of the ministers here. I just, I, I'm so excited about today's sermon. I just can't handle it. So who's excited about being in the house of the Lord today? Anybody excited? Okay, you all can do better than that. Who's excited, right? Yeah, give Jesus praise. But we are in our current sermon series called We Are... And for anyone new, we are looking at five life-giving, focus-driven statements of who we are. So somebody say, we are. That's right. First, we are on mission with the Great Commission. That's first who we are. Second, we are on purpose for God's purpose. That is who we are. And today's we are statement is all about serving but let me start off with a, with a story about my family. It's kind of a funny story. So when I was a youth minister years ago, Bridget, and Bridget had become really good friends with one of our teenage girls in the youth group. And she had graduated high school and started going to Georgetown College. And one of the Sundays that she was at church and Bridget was at church and they were hanging out and talking, she, Bridget found out that, that this girl was traveling a long distance to have to go to Georgetown College. So Bridget being Bridget was just kind of like, hey, Becca, why don't you just come stay with us for a while? And that turned into one day, and turn, one day turned into two days, and two days turned into every, oh, every day of the week. So she ended up just moving in with us. So I'll never forget it. She had been living with us for a couple of weeks, and Becca was awesome. We were so excited about having her. And, and I just looked at Becca one night, and I just said, well, Becca, how, how, was your, how, how was your kind of adjustment to being in the house? She's like, oh, it's, it's going great, Bart. And I was like, well, is there any observations about our house that you have? And she's like, Bart, let, let me tell you something. And it's so funny, I'll never forget this. She goes, oh, yes, I noticed that you and Bridget really love each other. And I'm like, okay, that's good. She's like, I mean, you are always flirting with her. It's like you all are teenagers or something. You, Bart, are always flirting with Bridget. You really love her. And I guess I'm like, yeah, I really do love her. That's awesome. That's, that, that's how she always described. She was like, Bart, you're always doing this. Which raises a question that I want to ask you today. If somebody were to, to describe you with the word always what would they say? What would they say? He or she are always doing this or that. Here's the question, is that what are you always doing? What would others say that you are always doing? What would others say that you're always up to? People might say that you are always encouraging or always complaining. They may say that you're always finding fault or finding good. That, that people may say, you know, this person is always working or working out. That this person is always sharing their faith. Or they're always sharing something on social media. What would others say, gang, that you are always doing? And so I want to warn you today. Today's we are statement is going to kind of go against what most people are always doing. Today's we are statement is this is that we are servants of him serving them. We are servants of him, the most high God, serving them, everybody. We are servants of God, and we are called to serve him by serving them. And if we are honest, most people don't always serve others. Have you noticed this? Most people look to be served. I mean, what can I get? How popular can I get? How, how can I get my name out there? What are they supposed to do for me? For, for life during this time, oftentimes, is really all about being selfish and self-centered and self-gratifying and self-promoting. I mean, in fact, did you all know this? That if, if, you were, if you were to ask a teenager today what they wanted to do when they grew up, the most common answer is to be a celebrity or to be a YouTube star, be an influencer. Like the research says that 54% of all teenagers want to be a YouTube star. Well, and let's not throw stones in this glass house because when I was a kid, you know what I wanted to be? I wanted to be the goat at anything. You all know what the goat is, right? Anybody know what the goat is? What does the goat stand for? The greatest of all time. I wanted to be the greatest of all time at something. How about you? when you were growing up, right? I mean, we all kind of want to have this greatest of all time mentality. 
But the problem with that is it, it's this me-focused, celebrity-wanting, greatest-of-all-time kind of thinking that's very opposite of what Jesus taught. It's the opposite of what Jesus taught. Jesus said this in Mark chapter 9, verse 35. Jesus sat down with them and called the 12 disciples together and said this, anyone who wants to be what? First must be the very what? Last. But he didn't just stop there. He said, and the what? Servant of all. Jesus doesn't say, if you want to be first, then you always have to make sure everyone and everything is about you. Jesus says that if you want to be first, then you must be last because you are the servant, the servant of all. For Jesus taught this in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Jesus doesn't say that if you want to be first, you need to promote yourself and strive to be the goat according to the world standards and then follow him. No, 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 no. Jesus says you must first deny that part of you that tells you that you need to be served, that everything is all about you, and you need to pick up your cross daily and follow him. For Jesus calls us to something different, this different calling where we don't focus on me and you don't focus on you, but we focus on we. We focus on others. If you're a follower of Jesus, we are not called to be served, selfish, self-centered people, but instead Jesus calls us to be servants. And servants are denying themselves and taking on the very nature of Jesus. In other words, as Jesus followers, serving is not just something that we do. It's an action that reflects who we are. Serving isn't just what we do. A servant at our core is who we are, gang. Let me say it this way. If you are a follower of Jesus, we are servants. You are a servant. I am a servant. We are servants. We are servants of God. We are servants of the Most High God serving everyone. Say it with me. We are servants. Say it. We are servants of Him. Say it. Of Him serving them. Excellent. That is who we are. That is not just something we do. That is who we are. We are servants of the Most High God, serving everyone, gang, everyone. Because when we serve others, we are actually serving Jesus. It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter where they're from. It doesn't matter the color of their skin or how they smell. It doesn't matter what their accent is like. We serve them because we serve them because we are actually serving him through them. So what are you always doing? If someone were to describe you with the word always, what would they say? Well, hopefully it's you would be like the person in Acts chapter 9, verse 36. Now, this is a very powerful verse to speak into someone who's always doing something that's of God. And it says this, in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. And in Greek, her name was Dorcas. Now, let's just take a moment here and feel really sorry for Dorcas. Because her mommy and daddy did not name her well to go through elementary school, did she? Right? I mean, kids can be really mean. And you know, I mean, I, what rhymes with Bart? I mean, come on now, right? But anyway... Her name was Dorcas. But did you know that she is the first Greek female mentioned in the New Testament? Her name means gazelle. And a lot of scholars think that, that she was beautiful. Well, I'll just phrase it this way. I hope she was beautiful with the name Dorcas. You know what I'm saying? But what we do know is that she was always doing we know what she was always doing. We know what the people around her would say that she was always doing because this verse gives us a description of her. So what was Dorcas always doing? Check out the rest of the verse. She was always doing what? Good and helping the poor. Dorcas was always doing good 
and helping the poor. Instead of trying to be the goat, instead of trying to be a self-promoter and get on YouTube and do all these things, she was always serving others because she knew who she was. She was a servant of him serving them. So how do we as followers of Jesus, how do we serve them? How do we serve them? You might say, well, Bart, I can't, I can't really make clothes. Well, you just don't want clothes that I would make, by the way. But I, I can't really make clothes to give to the poor. I can't really sing like the people on stage or play instruments like the people on stage. So, so what can I do? Bart, I'm not really good at teaching or preaching or speaking or, or anything like that. How can I really make a difference? Well, I want to help you today and make this really, really, really simple. I want to give you three simple images from Scripture and tie them into very simple stories that will go along with Scripture to make them memorable, to inspire you to serve because of who you are, because you are servants of the Most High God. You are servants of the Most High God. So how do we serve others? Here are three images. Let me start with number one. Number one, we bring some bread. We bring some bread. I want to show you a story in the Old Testament about King David. I mean, most people know about King David, right? I mean, he's really famous. He kind of, he kind of was a war hero, and he kind of killed Goliath, and the, that's how he kind of became famous and got some notoriety. And he, when he would come back from battle, I don't know if you all know this or not, when he would come back from a battle that he had won, so many people admired him, they would actually sing songs to him as he was like the conquering hero. And I'm still waiting for Bridget to do that when I come home from church. She almost spit her water out just then, sorry. I mean, but they would literally sing songs to David about how wonderful and how powerful of a hero and conqueror he was, which raises a question. Why was David so great? Why was David so great? A lot of people would say that David was great because he won the battle and battles. But I would submit to you that David was great because he brought some bread. He brought some bread. Let me say it again. A lot of people would say David was great because he won the battles. But I would submit to you it's not because he won the battles, it's because he brought some bread. So if you look at all throughout his life, whether he was playing the harp for King Saul or doing things behind the scenes, David had this attitude in his heart to bring some bread. For this man was promoted in the kingdom of God because he had the heart of a servant. Before he even slayed the giant, he brought bread. What does that mean to bring bread? Well, David was the youngest of eight brothers. I mean, can you imagine? He was the youngest of eight brothers. And he was the son of a man named Jesse. The older brothers were off fighting the war. Actually, they were kind of preparing for the war and kind of preparing to fight the battle. And David is young, and, and he wants to be with his brothers. So his dad one day says, David, come here. Son, I need you to do something. And it's not going to look that important, but it's very important to God. And this is what the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 17. It says this, One day Jesse said to David, Take this basket of roasted grain and these ten loaves of what? Bread. And carry them quickly to your brothers. And at the end of verse 18, it says this, See how your brothers are getting along and bring back a report on how they are doing. In other words... He's like, hey, David, I know you want to fight the battle. First, you have to bring some bread. First, you have to be willing to do something that seems so insignificant, stuff that people aren't even going to see. And what you may do is you may feel like it's behind the scenes and that, and that you're, it's not really that important, but it's really, really important. But the way that you are prompted in the kingdom of God, gang, is not to be served, but to serve. And if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you serve. We serve. The greatest among you is a servant of the one of the ways that you can actually simply be obedient to God and to do it behind the scenes. You need to bring some bread. Someone say, bring some bread. Let's do it again. Someone say, bring some bread. Next, you need to provide a ride. You need to provide a ride. 
I love this Old Testament prophecy from Zechariah. And in and, and, and 533, 53 years before the event actually took place, he prophesied that one day the king, the Messiah, would come and take his rightful place riding to town on a donkey. Now, this prophecy would have blown people's minds because no one really ever thought that a king that would come and take his rightful place of power would come in riding on a donkey. I mean, the kings back then would ride in on like white stallions, right? I mean, they would come with long robes and big crowns and people singing their praises and paparazzi taking pictures. I mean, if you want the equivalent to today, if the king would come, he would ride in on a private jet right in town on a stretch limo as he opened the sunroof and he was standing up waving at everybody. And the paparazzi would be around taking his picture. But what Jesus does is he comes in riding on a donkey. That's equivalent to today of coming in to ride in on a moped. That's what Jesus did. Now fast forward 553 years into this prophecy that Jesus says to his disciples, I want you to secure a donkey for me, for this prophecy is about to come true. And Jesus goes on to say that if anyone asks you why you're taking this donkey, tell them this, the Lord needs it, and that should be enough. And so how can you serve him through them? Well, you can simply provide a ride, because that's exactly what this business person in the New Testament did. And what I love most about the story is that we don't know their name. We don't even know what they did for a living. We don't know if they owned one donkey or a hundred donkeys. We do know and can find through research that this guy had a business of some type and he had at least one donkey because a donkey back then was a luxury to be able to afford a donkey. And this guy simply said, yes, you can take what I have and I will provide a ride. Notice what this guy didn't say. He doesn't say, well, I don't want you to take that donkey because that donkey's brand new. He's never been ridden, and he is a high-end model because he has upgraded hooves, and he's been pre-scented so you don't smell like a donkey when you're, after you're riding it. For this is the best of my best, and it's going to cost you, or you can't have it. Now, he doesn't say that, does he? What does he actually say? Well, it's ir- ironic because we don't have what he says, but we have what happened. So as they were untying the donkey in Luke 19, its owner asked them, why are you untying the colt, which is the young donkey? They replied, the Lord needs it. And what do we have in verse 35? That they brought the donkey to Jesus. The owner provided a ride and served instead of making money because the owner was a servant of the Most High God. So how can you make a difference as a servant? You can first bring some bread or you can provide a ride. Because when you provide a ride, as this guy did, when you provide a ride to Jesus on a donkey, that meant that he was coming in as the king and Jesus was going to make a difference. Third, you can also take a towel. In fact, to me, this is one of the most powerful pictures in all the New Testament, really all the Bible. Because the setting is Passover, gang. And it's Thursday night, and there's this secret meeting that's going on with Jesus and his guys. And Jesus is sitting there with his disciples, and he knows that he's about to give his life. I mean, he knows what is about to come. And in other words, the very reason that he is here on earth is about to come to pass, and he is going to have to suffer a lot. And then the argument breaks out among the disciples. And do you know what that argument was about? Which disciple was the goat? Which one was the greatest of all time? Which, who is the goat? And this is exactly the argument that broke out right in front of Jesus, right before he was going to give his life. And who do you think is the greatest disciple of all time? I mean, you can just imagine how that conversation went, right? Or that argument went when they're trying to prove who's the goat. I just picture the Apostle John. Now, this is the opinion of me. This is the book of Bart, so this isn't in Scripture, but I can just imagine, you can imagine with me, that the Apostle John kind of says, well, it's obviously me. I am the greatest of all time because everyone knows that I'm the one that Jesus loves. 
And do you all realize that that's how John described himself in the Gospel of John? Like he talked about himself in the second person. I mean, even professional athletes at least speak in the third person, right? But, but John is like, oh, well, it's got to be me because I am the one that Jesus loves. And I can just imagine Peter over here rolling his eyes so hard like a teenage girl that everybody hears it. You all know what I'm talking about? Come on, teenage girls, roll your eyes for me. Everybody can hear that. Shelby, I'm looking at you, girl. I got to embarrass you. I haven't embarrassed my niece in some time. But I can just imagine Peter just rolling his eyes, right? And I imagine Peter kind of going, John, what are you talking about? You aren't the goat because remember, I'm the one that got out of the boat and you stayed in the boat. I walked with Jesus and everyone else, you, 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 and you, and you, you stayed in the boat and I walked with Jesus. So that means I am the greatest. And I can just hear one of the other apostles because you know how guys are, right? Yeah, Peter, but you only took like three steps, you know. And then here comes Bartholomew. And he's like, well, guys, I'm the greatest of all time. And like everybody looks at him and goes, we didn't even know you were in the room, dude. Who are you, you know? And Bartholomew's like, oh, sorry. You know, I'm just picking on Bartholomew just because he's not really well known. Sorry. But who's the goat? Who's the greatest of all time? Jesus is sitting at this table. Jesus is knowing what is about to come to pass, that, that we are called to serve others, and he is here to serve and not be served. And in this moment, he looks around, and you know what he sees? He sees proud hearts, stubborn minds, and dirty feet. And so what does Jesus do? He knows that the only way to break through to the proud hearts and stubborn minds is to do the most scandalous act of service in the entire world. Gang, this was so scandalous that everyone in the room gasped when it happened. They literally gasped because no rabbi, no master, no head of anything would ever, ever, ever dream of doing this. So I thought we would practice gasping. Because I want to read scripture, and I want you to gasp in the proper place, okay? Can everybody gasp? And I really want a good gasp, especially all the kids and teenagers in the room. Give me your good gasp like your parents just told you something shocking, okay? So ready to gasp? Ready? One, two, three, gasp. Good, good. And so when Jesus saw the disciples debating who's the greatest of all time, Jesus saw proud hearts, stubborn minds, and dirty feet. So we got up from the meal took off his outer clothing, wrapping a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin. And you all ready? You all ready to gasp? He began to wash his disciples' feet, gasp, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Now, if you were there, this would have been the most uncomfortable experience in the room. Everyone would gasp and get uncomfortable that it was so tangible in the room that this tension you could cut with a knife. For so many people are saying, no, 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 Jesus, no, 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 you can't do this. You can't do this, not you. You can't wash my feet. Now, now you may say, what's the big deal about washing feet, Bart, in that time? Well, first off, you wouldn't wash my feet today, right? I mean, let's be honest. And you wouldn't want to because I have toes the size of fingers. Overshare, sorry. But this was a tradition and a custom back then. That people, that guests would come to your house, the bottom of the bottom of slave would wash their feet because their feet were caked in like dust and dirt and things that you don't want to really talk about because they didn't have a sewage system. You know what I'm saying? So, when, like, if you were to go to someone's house, one of the first things they would do is have you take your sandals off and they would wash your feet because they didn't want that in the house. And what does Jesus do? He looks around the room and he sees proud hearts, stubborn minds, and dirty feet. And Jesus puts on the slave's apron, puts water into a bowl, and takes a towel and washes their feet. Now, this is the most scandalous, outrageous act of service ever because of who did it. 
Who did it, gang? Jesus did it. Who is Jesus? He is the Son of God. He is the bread of life. He is the Prince of Peace. He is the living water. He is the great I am. He is the great high priest. He is the light of the world, the Lamb of God, the righteous judge, the living cornerstone, the true vine, the King of glory, the chosen one. He is the King of all kings. He is the Lord of all lords. He is the chosen one. He is the Alpha. He is the Omega. He is the beginning. He is the end. He is the first and the last. He is the great shepherd. He is the rock. He is our Redeemer. He He is our righteousness. He is our sanctification. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. He is our Messiah. And He took a towel and water and washed their dirty feet. Because Jesus knew the greatest among them is never the one who wants to be served, but makes servants as a heart of a servant and is a servant because Jesus was always a servant for Jesus didn't come to be served but to serve he gave his life as a ransom for our sins and if that doesn't blow your mind think about this Jesus even washed Judas's feet and he knew what Judas had already done and you know what Jesus still did So no matter what anybody has said about you in front of you or behind your back or done to you, you know what you can do? You can be like Jesus and wash their feet. So what can we do to serve them? We can bring some bread, we can provide a ride, or we can take a towel. Because serving is not something we do. A servant is who we are. We are servants of the Most High God, so we serve everyone. We are servants of Him serving them. Because we, because when we serve others, gang, we are actually serving Jesus Himself. Now, I know that doesn't make sense, but let me explain. How can we be serving Jesus when we serve others? Well, Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 32, that in the end times, he, people are going to stand before him and he's going to judge them. He's going to separate the people out and he's going to separate as the good shepherd to separate the sheep from the goats. For he put sheep on his right and goats on his left. And the goats on his left, he, you know, it's kind of like this, who wants to be the greatest of all time? Well, here's the goat, Right? Well, in verse 41, this is what Jesus tells the goats. Then the king will turn to those on his left and say, away away with you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. And then Jesus is going to turn to those on his right, the sheep, and say this in verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your house. I was naked and you, and you gave me clothes. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. And Jesus tells this to the sheep and the sheep are kind of going, when do we do these things? I mean, yeah, Jesus, we want to do those things, but when did we do them? When did we feed you and give you something to drink and all those other things? And in verse 30, Jesus tells this. And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it for the one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, what does he say? You weren't doing it for them, you were doing it to me. When we serve others in the name of Jesus, then we are actually serving Jesus. Do you get that? You see, servant, serving isn't what we do, it's who we are. Think of it this way. We are servants of him, serving them, because serving them means we're serving him. Does that make sense? Let me say it again, because that'll preach, right? We are servants of him, serving them, because serving them means we're serving him if we're doing it in the name of Jesus. I mean, how do you, want, how do you become great, gang? You become great by, by being less about you and more about him, so you serve them. Because serving isn't just something that we do. A servant is who we are. It's who we are. Then Jesus will look at his sheep and he will say to us, which I can't think of anything sweeter, can you? Well done, 
my good and faithful servant. Because serving isn't just something that we do, but a servant is who we are. Now listen, in the kingdom of God, the little things are big things. It's the little things that when nobody else is looking, it's when you feel like something you're doing isn't really that significant. It's in your faith with the little things that God trusts you with. It's actually big things. And promotion in the kingdom of God is, is not a reflection of self-promotion, but a selflessness of serving, of putting others ahead of yourself. And I tell you, I look around this room, and I know our church, we have so many people like that here at Community. From behind the scenes of who you don't see, of Jim and Daryl that go around and pick up our trash for us twice a week, to Bruce and Cindy changing HVAC system filters, and Bruce coming in and making sure the church didn't burn down that one time. Thanks, Bruce. <laughs> to Jim and Kirby and Reese, who are currently in the green room right now to make sure that this service gets out to everybody online. To Jerry and the slew of people that work the computer to make sure that you know what to sing when you need to sing it. And to help you with the sermon notes. To the nursery workers that are holding babies that are getting puked on and all those other horrible things in the name of Jesus. God bless them. To the workers in the kids' ministry that play games and teach Jesus, but also speak positive truth in their lives. To the teen workers that help teens navigate through the most dangerous season of their entire life in the name of Jesus. To Mike at the connections table. To all the people that go through and serve people and love the valley. To the ladies of the M&Ms that serve. To all the followers of Jesus that don't look at their job, their school, their team as an opportunity to be served, but to serve in the name of Jesus. To our elders that pray and serve you all the time. To those that teach and lead small groups so that we can grow to be like Jesus. To Stephanie and Donna who lead Bible Bowl to make sure the Bible gets into our kids. To our parents and our grandparents that serve wherever they are to Russell and Mason that put out the signs on Sunday morning to make sure to help guests find where they need to be, to those that are helping with Operation Christmas Child, to those that help pack the meals for eyes so we can send them to Africa. I could keep going on and on and on, but you know what I mean. Serving is not something that we do. Serving is who we are. We are servants of the Most High God, and we are called by our Master to serve everyone. So what are you always doing? What are you always doing? What are you known for always doing? If you're a follower of Jesus, we should always be known as bringing some bread, providing a ride, or taking a towel. For you are salt and light wherever you may be. So how do you become great? It's never by serving yourself or making sure you're always served, but denying yourself and serving others because it's not about us. It's all about Him. And here's my honest suggestion for you today. For every single follower of Jesus, I would suggest that you pick a consistent place to serve in. This is where you, you're able to use your spiritual gifts and your passions and talents and abilities somewhere, someplace in the church, or maybe even somewhere in the community. So where do you need to serve? That would be my last question for you. Where do you need to serve? Go ahead, Kelsey, go to the next slide. Where do you need to serve? Because you need to serve somewhere because you're a servant of the Most High God. This is who you are. And you will never be fulfilled in life until you know who you are and what you're supposed to do. Use your gifts to honor him. Use your talents and your passions to serve others. And so I want to help you with this. I want to help you with your next step. So if you would like to serve here at Community Christian Church, here's what I want you to do. I want you to scan this QR code or text serve to our texting service. Go ahead, Kelsey, to the next slide. Well, I thought there was another slide up there. It's supposed to be the QR code. Is it not up there? Okay, well, it's on your sermon notes. For some reason, it's not. It didn't get it to... But there is, so if you could text the word serve, 
So 606-268-0103. We want to help you with your next step. Or if you have sermon notes, there's a QR code at the bottom right. Make sure you pick one up on the way out and scan that. Because we want to help you. Because we are servants of the Most High God, serving everyone. For we, <laughs> we are servants of him, serving them. Let's pray. Father, we ask you that you would stir in us, shake us up, God, to move out of being selfish and being served and being self-centered so that we can serve others because that is what you've truly called us to be. Because it's time that we start denying ourselves so that we can and will serve others. Please, Lord, let us be like Jesus, who was not here to be served, but to serve. And so from this day forward, Lord, I pray that we would see ourselves as your servants, serving others, because it's all about you. And we can only know this because of your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.